The Lord be with you. Thank you. You heard me. That's good. Uh, We're going to, of course, as I said, look at the uh, Luke 2 passage today. Uh, So as I mentioned in my opening remarks, the uh, idea of leaving a legacy uh, for an Advent theme isn't immediately apparent unless you consider it in this way. Uh, So first of all, you know, of course, we leave a legacy with our children. There's no question we leave a legacy as in money to charitable organizations. Those kinds of things are certainly legacies. But really what I'm talking about today is leaving a legacy as a Christian, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, what is your legacy? And understand the connection to Advent is this, that unless you live to the second coming, the second Advent of Christ, you're going to have your own personal Advent, your own meeting of Jesus, your own second coming when you die. And so the question comes, you got Simeon and Anna who clearly... Their legacy has lasted for 2,000 years through the Scriptures, right? Jesus said it of the woman who anointed him with oil, that what she has done for him would be preached everywhere the gospel was preached in the world, and it was through the Word of God, right? And so similarly, you have Simeon and Anna, and particularly Simeon, who is who we're going to talk about today, leaving a legacy. But what about you? What about your legacy as a Christian disciple? You're not just a, you know, whatever it is that you do for a living. You're not just a stay-at-home mom, stay-at-home dad. You're not just a, an attorney, an accountant, a person at principal, a pioneer. You're not just a teacher or whatever it happens to be that you do for a living. You're a Christian first. You're a disciple of Jesus first. And so what is the legacy that you're going to leave as a result of who you are as a Christian disciple of Jesus? All right, so to get at that, we're going to, again, look at, the, uh, at, at Simeon. I'm going to punch into St. Peter's life a little bit too, but primarily uh, at Simeon. And this amazing, he's an amazing character, isn't he? Did did you notice, by the way, that three times the Holy Spirit was mentioned in that one reading, that the Holy Spirit was upon him, that the Holy Spirit spoke to him, that the Holy Spirit drove him to do what he did when he went, went to the temple? I dare say, by the way, the same was true of the prophetess Anna, all right? But uh, let, me, let me begin by talking about this. Who he was was certainly a man of God, and I would consider each and every one of you as a Christian person a man or a woman of God. That's true. At the very least, by the way, you're his property. But you are, in fact, by your baptism into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he's claimed you, he's placed his spirit upon you. You have, you have the same Holy Spirit that, that, that Simeon and Anna did, you understand. And so you are his, you belong to him, And so de facto, these things should be said about you. This man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And here you go. I said it a moment ago. The Holy Spirit, that's true about you too. Let me say it again. The Holy Spirit was upon him. All right. So let's talk about this uh, from uh, Romans chapter 12. Again, if you've got a Bible or a device, I'd encourage you to open it. So uh, this, is, this segment of Scripture is a very important segment of Scripture because it's often called the marks of a Christian. I have brought it to you many times for that reason. So initially in Romans 12, Paul talks about being a living sacrifice. We've been there, done that. That's an oxymoron. In other words, uh, sacrifices didn't live. They died. And so what, it, what does that mean, living sacrifice? You die to yourself and you live instead for Jesus And by living for Jesus, you're living for others. So listen then to how that plays out here in Romans 12, uh, verses 9 and following. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. The word just means hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. I'd suggest to you in this day and time, many people love what is evil and abhor what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Boy, that, that's a lost art. And I cannot, uh, as a guy that was raised by a southern mother that said, open the door for women and say yes, sir, and no, sir, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, I'd encourage you to do the same thing. Be a person who shows honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Rather, Paul, <laughs> Paul should write, be fervent in the spirit. And here you go. This is really the overarching theme of the day. Serve the Lord. You are as a Christian. Yes, you're a Christian. Yes, you're a disciple of Jesus. But you are also a servant of the Lord. It's not just reserved for full-time church workers. It's all of us as Christian people serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, even uh, tribulation like we're experiencing right now. 
Uh, constant, be constant in prayer. Don't forget Luther, and, Luther uh, said, uh, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be a human being that doesn't breathe. All right? So, so again, uh, being constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saint, saints. Seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. I know that that's hard, right? Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Hold hands, in other words. Re- Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Even people you disagree with. In fact, we're going to get to that in just a second. Don't be haughty, but associate with lowly people. Never be wise in your own sight, because if you're wise in your own sight, you're not wise at all. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, here you go, Christian, this is a word for today. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with everyone or peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. I'm going to go further than I have on the screen. But leave it to the wrath of God. For Here's that famous segment, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. He quotes a psalm here, for in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now again, I, as I said it a moment ago, this is what's called the marks of a Christian. This is what a Christian looks like. And so I'd ask the question, Christian... Man of God, woman of God, is that what you look like? You see, we really can, in fact, make a difference in this world by acting in this way. This is, a, well, this is the theme of, of Advent and Christmas every year, right? That is the light from above coming to us and the light from us, the light from, which is from above, going out to others, shining in the darkness. And, and come on, you guys, if ever there was a time that we needed to be a light shining in the darkness, it's now. A- amen? People need to see the light of Christ in us. And what I just read for you is that very thing. All right. Um, I... I uh, said at earlier services, uh, pastors almost always do things in threes. So I've had two illustrations about a person tailgating me on the freeway. Here's number three, the last one I'll do for a while. All right, so, so it's Friday and I was coming into work and I, I don't ever drive in the fast lane. I, I hate to say it, I, I, you know, my kids will tell you I drive like a grandma. Uh, I'm not sure that's a bad thing, all right? Uh, but uh, so I, 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 was, I just happened to be in the fast lane and I couldn't get out of the fast lane. There's a semi-truck, and there's a person in front of them and a person behind them. And up behind me comes this dude in a, a big, hopped-up, white Chevy pickup. No, no aspersions. I drive a Toyota. All right, fine. Uh, but he just comes, just blazing, comes up right behind me, and he's right on my, right on my tail. All right? By the way, I, I want to make a, a clarification. I'm not against tailgating at Iowa State and Iowa games. Tailgate away. All right? I'm talking about tailgating on the freeway. All right? So he's right on me, and I can't go anywhere, right? And, and in fact, there was someone in front of me, and you know, you're doing the typical look in the mirror going, dude, look, there's a guy in front of me, all right? So he's right on me, right on me, right on me. The guy pulls away. I am not kidding you guys. I had to do 85 miles an hour to get away from this guy and get in front of the semi. I, needless to say, totally dangerous. Uh, endangering me, proving that he, all he does is think about himself. Arrogant, prideful, you name it, all right? And so this is the best part of the story. He goes past me. No, he didn't have a Gloria Day sticker on. I know that's what you're thinking, all right? That would have been hilarious. I would have followed them until I got to the work, uh, to work all right? But no, goes past me, and the name of his business is in the back window. Big, bold, blue letters stuck on the window on the back. It happened to be a landscaping company with the name, and by the way, it's his name, and the phone number. No, I didn't call him. I really wanted to call him. Hey, bro, I'm the guy in the Toyota you just bugged, all right? So I didn't. But so this is the deal. What what I'm telling you is this. I went and looked on the internet and found his business. By the way, he's the only guy in his landscaping, very small landscaping business. It was the owner. It wasn't just some some duty hired that, you know, didn't, didn't do the right thing. It was him. Now, what do you think I think? You think I'm going to hire him to do my landscaping? You, you know, if I was vengeful, by the way, I take, take seriously, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. If I was vengeful, I'd tell you the name of the business. I know 1,100 families in this church. That's a lot of business he's going to lose. You understand I'm not, and I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to tell you who it was, but you understand what I'm saying, don't you, Christian? 
Your actions follow you. For 2,000 years, people have been saying, Simeon and Anna, righteous, godly people. 2,000 years, if we last that long, 2,000 years from now, what will they say about you and me, right? The, the actions that you bring to this world are Im- important. They're absolutely important for showing people Jesus Christ, for them seeing I, you can see on the screen, seeing who you are. I, I put it in the past tense because I'm presuming you're, you're gone now. We're doing your, your uh, funeral now, you see. Who you were as you lived out this life. Now, this is the thing. I, the, all, what I said is true. And please understand something, Christian. Every, everything that I'm saying to you right now, I'm saying to me too. All right? In fact, it's doubly important for me as a leader of God's people to be above reproach to be a person of honor, to be a person that shows his faith in this world, okay? But I, I want to be careful because I, I'm not going to lump something on you and say, yeah, why don't you go walk on water like Jesus did? Now, why don't you turn water into wine and raise the dead like Jesus did? Be Jesus in this world because you're not going to be. I, I get it. I mean, I get that, you know, the list that I read, you've probably got things in your mind going, yeah, I do that pretty good, but man, those three, I don't do so well. And so I want to give you a little rope here, but encourage you to do something still, all right? So I'm going to take you to, as I said, I'm going to take you to Peter's story, and this is when they, you know, Jesus says, hey, take the boats out, throw the net on the other side of the boat, and you're going to catch some fish. And Peter's mad because they fished all night. And Peter, it's almost like this. Peter's saying to Jesus, look, you're a preacher. I'm a fisherman. Why don't you just stay out of my business, all right? I know better than you do, and it's evidenced by what happened. So they catch the large draft of fifth fish, and just means a bunch of them. They're both boats are sinking, and Peter recognizes Jesus' uh, deity, in my opinion, in the moment the Creator God was standing with him. And what does he do? He, he lays down at his feet and says, depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now, why is this important? Because you're not going to live the marks of a Christian every day. And it doesn't help the kingdom for you to fake like you do. Or, Or to have an expectation that other people will live that way. Without fault. Because it's just not going to happen. So where do you need to go? You need to go to this idea of, I am a sinner and not just before God, away from me, Lord, right? But, but with other people, too, to be able to admit when you're wrong. To be able to admit when you blow it, right? To be able to say, you know what? This is the way I want to live. I don't always live this way, but it's the way that I want to live so that I can show people Jesus Christ. But you know what? In this instance, I really messed up and I need your forgiveness. So let me, let me take you to a parable, Luke 18. In Luke 18, that is. Not for forgive me, I, I don't know if you can tell, but I broke my earpiece but like two seconds before I walked out onto the chancel. I broke my earpiece, so it's in here going like this on my head. So, see, I told you, it's flopping around. All right, we'll just make it work. So Luke 18, 9 to 14. So this parable is very important for us as Christian people to see how we approach other people even when we're living for Jesus, all right? So... So here you go, Luke 18, I sometimes called the Pharisee and the publican. Publican is just a tax collector. He also told this parable to some, listen to this, who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and here you go, treated others with contempt. I'm better than you are. I got it together, you don't. I never blow it, you do. In fact, you've blown it these many times. I got a record of it, right? So two men, here's, here's the parable, went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself, and I would suggest praying to himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like that dude, that tax collector. I fast twice, twice a week and I give tithes of all I get. This guy clearly didn't know what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, and that is that out of the heart come all sorts of wicked things, theft, adultery, lust, you name it. Out of everybody's heart, including the Pharisee, you see. It's just a parable, I understand. But including the Pharisee. And so what's the posture knowing that's the truth? That none of us can live up to Romans chapter 12. Now, don't get me wrong. Never living up to Romans chapter 12 is not acceptable. 
oh, well, I'm just a sinner, no big deal. No, my point is, when you blow it, admitting that you blow it. In fact, uh, I'll do it this way. In, in Proverbs 15, 1, it says, a soft answer turns away wrath. What, memorize it. Live it. When you mess up, just admit that you mess up. When you blow it with someone, say, you know what? I blew it, and I need your forgiveness. So listen to how we're supposed to act then. Uh, Verse 13, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift his eyes up to heaven but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Sounds a lot, by the way, you can mark in your Bible Psalm 51. Sounds like what David wrote there after being caught with Bathsheba. I tell you, this man went down to his house righteous, justified, rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, uh, I was uh, sharing with First Service that when I was a youth worker in San Diego, we had a day school, and we had about 150 kids in the day school. And so the teachers, bless their hearts, were sick of the kids by lunchtime and wanted to go have lunch with, in a quiet space together. So they asked the youth worker to come out on the playground and play with the kids. And I, I was just a big kid anyway. I loved kickball and all that stuff. And so I'd come out and do the playground. But one of the things I taught the kids was this. When, you know, just say, for example, I'll just use Johnny and Susie. It's the typical name on a playground, right? Uh, Johnny threw a ball, hit Susie in the head uh, and hurt her. I would bring them together and Johnny had to say to her on my playground, you're going to be on my playground? This is what you're going to say. Johnny would say, I repent of what I did. Susie would say, you're forgiven. Now you say, kind of harsh, Joe, don't you think? No, actually it's great. I had parents coming to me and saying, my kid is totally, he said to his brother, I repent of what I did. But that's who we are supposed to be. Let's just get over our bad selves and realize that we're going to blow it and we're going to do so regularly. We're broken. And so be willing to say, I repent of what I did. Which means, by the way, turn around, don't do it again, Johnny. Don't throw the ball at her again, Johnny, right? Turn around, repent, but also on the other side to be willing to forgive. If if you live that way, it's just so much better. Your life is so much better. When a soft answer is how you live your life, right? Because it turns away wrath. All right. Amen? Amen. All right. So in all this, uh, there's one, one last turn that I need to make for you, and it's this, that I, I said it early on in Romans 12 segment, that you are, in fact, it's not just full-time church workers, it's every Christian is a servant of the Lord, a servant of the Lord, all right? And I, I want to prove it to you by another passage, and so uh, let me just take you back to, um, I'll take you back to Simeon for a second. Notice what Simeon says, Lord, now you are letting, what, what's the next two words, say it out loud? Your servant, depart in peace according to your word. Now, again, I'm going to say we often think of church, full-time church workers that way, but every Christian is a servant of the Lord, as evidenced, right, uh, by Simeon's words, but also by the life of another person. I'm going to take you to Acts 9. This is such a great story. Uh, it's, it's pretty brief. But this is about Tabitha, who's also, it's terrible. Luke writes, her name is also said Dorcas. I hate it. I just, I want to change that. Because what her name means is gazelle, by the way. But when we hear Dorcas, I'm, you know, we just think not good stuff, all right? So her name was Tabitha, her name was Dorcas. And listen to what happens uh, here in Joppa, all right? Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity, Log that in your brain. She's a servant of the Lord, all right? In those days, she became ill and she died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the window, excuse me, widows, windows, listen to me, all the widows stood beside him weeping. Now, notice what they did. Here's her legacy. Uh, showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. Let me remind you, she was full of good works and acts of charity. These were made for other people, you see. But Peter put them all outside, great news in the story, knelt down and prayed and turning to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up. He gave her her hand and raised her up. He was a good gentleman. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive 
And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord, and he stayed in Joppa for many days with one uh, called Simon the Tanner. In fact, uh, hang on a second. I want to take you over to something. So, so get, keep it in mind that she's a servant of the Lord. Don't, don't turn. Just listen to me read. Paul writes this in Philippians chapter 1. Um, it, it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death, legacy, during my life and at my death. For to me to live is Christ, you know these words, and to die is gain. For if I am to live on in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that's far better. But to, listen to this now. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, Paul says, he's not going to die, he's going to stick around. I, I take you to that passage because Paul and Lydia, uh, excuse me, uh, Paul and our sister in Joppa, they were servants of the Lord, you see. And, and so were you, Christian. This, this uh, Simeon song, Lord, let your servant now depart in peace, is your song. You see. And in fact, let me, let me just tell you a story about that. So when I was in uh, Peoria, a pastor, his last name was Gracie. Isn't that a great name for a pastor? Pastor Gracie, uh, right? And so Pastor Gracie was in his mid-80s or so, and he died. And he's just a great pastor, amazing pastor his whole life. And so uh, the, the sanctuary in uh, Peoria, it's, much, it's about twice the size of this one. It's about seven, 800. And there, it was just packed, and there were pastors everywhere. And so at the end of the funeral, uh, Pastor Gracie's grandson, who is a good friend of mine, Michael, uh, he has a great tenor voice, and he came and sang. I'm going to ask J uh, uh, James to come out and sing this for us. I think he's there, James. <laughs> Rot row. <laughs> Sorry, James. Why did I call you out while you're not there? So he's going to sing what we in our liturgy call the nunc dimittis. Nunc dimittis, Latin for now depart. All right, so brother, please. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I have a feeling some of you remember that, right? So beautiful at the end of a funeral of a pastor, right? Let your servant now depart in peace. But this is the thing. When did we sing that? It was after communion. It was the post-communion canical. You are the servant that is departing in peace, you see. Please get that in your brain, Christian. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he claimed you in baptism as his son or his daughter, but he also claimed you as his servant. Leave that as your legacy in this world. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen.